Introduction. History of the Manuscript. The mnemonic magical papyrus of London and Leiden was discovered at Thebes with other magical papyri, principally Greek, but dealing with the subjects of a like nature. In the early part of the last century, it was brought by Anastasi, who was at that time Swedish consul at Alexandria and made a large collection of Egyptian manuscripts. When Anastasi obtained the manuscript, it must already have been torn in two parts. And it is even probable that he obtained the two parts at different times since he sold his Egyptian collections, including the Leiden manuscript to the Dutch government in 1828, while the London portion was bought at the sale of his latter collections at Paris in 1857 for the British Museum, number 1072 in the Lenormand's catalog. The Leiden fragment was made known to the world much earlier than in the British Museum. I'm getting grumbling in the tumbling here. Its importance for the deciphering of the demotic script by help of the numerous glosses and graco characters was at once perceived by the distinguished scholar Ruvens, at that time, director of the Leiden Museum of Antiquities, who proceeded to study it carefully, and in 1830 published an admirable essay. It is a ma etrane sur les papyrus bilingues et grecs, in which he sketched the principal contents of the manuscript and indicated its value for the progress of demotic studies. He then took in hand its, rep its reproduction and the manuscripts was lithographed in facsimile under his direction. And he had corrected the proofs of the first plate when he was cut off by a premature death in 1835. His work was carried to completion and published by his successor in the directorship of the museum Lehmanns in 1839. Heinrich Brugsch studied it closely and drew from it most of the examples quoted in his Demotic Grammar published in 1855. But although latter scholars have frequently quoted from it and translated fragments of it, the manuscript has hitherto remained without complete translation, commentary, or glossary. The London manuscript, however, lay from 1857 onwards, almost unnoticed in the British Museum, to the late Dr. Pleite Lehman's successor at Leiden, belongs the credit of discovering that the two manuscripts originally formed one. He had studied the Leiden portion and at once recognized the handwriting of its fellow in London. Without publishing the fact, he communicated it to Professor Hess of Freiburg when the latter was working in Leiden on the manuscript there. Professor Hess went on to London and having fully confirmed Dr. Plight's statement published in 1892, a reproduction of the British Museum manuscript with an introduction, including the translation of one column and a glossary. Dear Nastiks Papyrus von London, ein Leitung Text u Demotics Dost Glosser von Gigi Hess. I, I'm approximating the translation. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. It's like German, right? So, um, Ruvens in his essay dwelt at some length on the Gnostic character of the manuscript. He devoted his attention mainly to the parts which contain the glosses, and those are almost exclusively magical invocations, among which occur the name of entities, spirits, and demons. By entities, I mean those considered to be gods, but um, when people worship all sorts of things, just, you know, will it matter one way or the other? He devoted his attention mainly, to, I, mean, I mean, they're considered the gods regardless, mainly to the parts which contain the glosses, and those are almost exclusively magical invocations, along with occur the names of the entities, spirits, and demons. Oh, I already got that. There. Egyptian, Syrian, Jewish, and strung together in a manner 
in a manner similar to those found in Gnostic writings and on Gnostic gems. He even went so far as to associate them with the name of a particular Gnostic leader, Marcus, of the second century, chiefly on the ground of his reported use of Hebrew and Syriac names in his invocation and the combination of vowels. In consequence, the manuscript has acquired the name of the Leiden Gnostic and the term Gnostic has been passed on to the London manuscripts. But as will be seen from the complete translation here published, there is nothing in the works related to the Gnostic systems. It deals with magic and medicine. And it seems a misnomer to call the manuscript Gnostic merely because part of the stock and trade of the magician and medicine man were a number of invocation names, which either picked up from the Gnostics or derived from sources common to him and them. Hence, it has been thought desirable to abandon the epithet Gnostic and to call the work the Magical Papyrus of London and Leiden. The condition of the manuscript. The London portion is in far better condition than the Leiden portion. The papyrus is pale in color and the ink is very black. black. Consequently, where the manuscript has not suffered material damage, it is easy to read. As the scribe wrote a beautiful and regular hand. The Leiden papyrus, on the other hand, has unfortunately suffered much as Lehmann's with a view to protecting the surface covered both recto and verso with vegetable paper, which probably could not be removed now without serious, uh, without serious injury to the manuscript, but either the paper or the adhesive matter employed with it has darkened and decayed, rendering the writing illegible in places. In 1829, while the manuscript was still in charge of Ravens, and before it had been subjected to the operation above described, he took a tracing of it, which has been preserved and which, though of little assistance in points of minute detail, may be relied on for filling up with certainty many groups which are now wholly lost in the original. The main body of the writing is on the recto, horizontal fibers, to the papyrus, while on the verso are written a miranda, medical prescriptions, and short invocations. The London manuscript is papyrus number 10,070 of the British Museum, formerly Anastasi um, 1072. The Leiden manuscript is known as 1 383, reckoned among the Anastasi manuscript as A65. The London portion forms the initial part of the manuscript and joins on to the Leiden portion without a break. The tenth and last column of the London manuscript and the first of the Leiden forming one column. The first London column is imperfect, and it is not possible to say with certainty whether the manuscript began with it or whether there was an interior part now lost. It's quite possible that it began here. On the other hand, it is certain that the manuscript is imperfect at the end, since the broken edge of the papyri, uh, uh, the papyrus at Leiden shows traces of a column of writing succeeding the present final column. It is impossible to estimate how much is lost as the manuscript is not an original composition on a definite plan, but a compilation of heterogeneous material collected together without any logical order. Now, Joseph Smith's um, papyrus was also said to be, was, well, I mean, was said to be significantly bigger than what they found. So that's an example of, yeah, they only found this much now, but there's, you know, saying how much actually was lost. The two portions, if joined together, would measure roughly speaking some five manuscripts, about 16 and a half feet in length and height. It averages nearly 25 centimeters, 10 inches. The writing in columns which there are 29 in the recto, while on the verso there are 33 small columns or portions of columns 
but these are not marked off as are the rectal columns by vertical and horizontal framing lines. The horizontal lines on the recto are continuous for the whole length of the papyrus. Nor are they written continuously, but they seem to have been jotted down there on account of the brevity and discontinuous character. The recto columns vary somewhat in size, but average 20 by 20 centimeters, uh, eight inch square. The writing is frequently carried beyond the framing lines. In each column, the recto, the number of lines is on average about 30 to 33, but the number is very irregular, ranging from 43 in one column to five in another. Uh, contents. As has been stated above, the manuscript is a compilation. An analysis of the contents will be found on page 14. From this will be seen to consist of mainly of directions for the divination processes involving numerous invocations together with erotica and medical prescriptions in which however magic plays as large a part as medicine and most of the early evidence of medicine kind of indicates that uh, it was never separate from whatever they considered religion to be until like modern times or something. Well, I mean, I guess it could have been separate here or there, but seldom, right? The manuscript is far from being unique in regard to its contents. Fragments of similar works in demotic exist at Paris. In the Lou number 3229, published by Mespero, Quelquez, Papyrus de Louvre, 1875. And at the Leiden, 1 384. Verso, Anastasi, 75. Touched by Lehman's Mons. The Musée de Leiden, 1842. Plates 226 through 227. A manuscript, partly demotic and partly Greek, the latter proportion being published by Lehmann's in the Pyre Gracchi. It's got, uh, I don't know, MUS abbreviated, LUGD abbreviated BAT abbreviated 1885 to Pyrus V and re edited by the Eteric Papyrus Magical MUS Lugd Bat. The Greek papyri containing similar texts are numerous, many examples having been published from the museums of Berlin, London, and Paris by Goodwin, Parthe, Lehmans, Wesley, and Kenyon. The well-known codex of Bibliothèque Nationale published by Wesley, Dexter, Kais, Equis, uh, AK dot WIS dot D E N K S C H R dot W I N W I S S dot W I N. Okay, so I don't know what those four are abbreviated as. Um, 36, 1888 contains a few invocations in Old Coptic along with the Greek, Griffith AZ, 1901, page 89. Five, and bibliography of the same in page 72. Magic was, from its earliest times, largely developed by the Egyptians in relation both to the dead and the living. Under the former head, both fall the pyramid text and other text found at the tombs, including most of the Book of the Dead, which consist mainly of magical invocations intended to make smooth the path of the deceased in the next world. Magical texts for the use of the living are found in the Harris Magical Papyrus, the Maternic Stila, 
edited by Golden Chef. But in 1877, the previous Chabas of 1860, and Kindred Stones, the Berlin Papyrus, edited by Ermin Zerber Sprucher für Mutter und Kind, 1901. Reference may be made to the volume on the Egyptian magic by Dr. Wallace Budge. 1899, and to a special study on vessel divination by E. Lefebvre, the vast divinator, and Sphinx, 1902. Six. 61. And also, Dietrich Abraxas, Kenyon, the catalog of Greek papyri, and B. M. 1, 62 in sequence. Miss. MacDonald in PSBA 13, 160 in sequence. Wunsch Setianch Verfluchungsstafelen aus Rom, etc. In the closely allied Department of Medicine. It is sufficient to refer to the Ebers Papyrus, the Cahoon Papyri, and the Berlin Medical Papyrus, edited by Brugge, Recommend Plate 87 to 107, which offer many parallels among the Greek medical writers. It is noticeable that Alexander of Tralles seems much more closely allied to the Egyptian school, if that be represented by our manuscript, than Galen. But though the subject matter of the manuscript is not without its interest for the history of magic and medicine, its chief claim to publication lies in its philological interest. From the first of its numerous glosses have attracted the attention of scholars and have been the means of fixing the value of a large number of demotic groups. Further, it is in date, probably the latest known papyrus written in the demotic script. Most of the glosses are really Coptic transcriptions and under this head may likewise be included all the Egyptian words written in cipher so that the manuscript in these furnishes us with a series of very early Coptic words, including several grammatical forms of great interest. Possibly, too, the text may be of importance in relation to the question of dialects in Egypt before Christianity. But that is a subject a little too worked out at present to allow of definite statements. The vocabulary is very extensive and includes a number of Greek words, the names of a hundred, well, over a hundred plants, besides numerous animals and minerals. Um, previous works on the manuscript. It may be useful to record here the names of those who have dealt with the manuscript at a greater length than a mere passing reference or quotation, and to whom we are indebted for many suggestions. Ruvens, Limans, Maspero, Revulaut, Pleite, Bruges, Max Muller, Hess, Groth. And as the London portion of the manuscript, which in the order of the contents is the first part, was published 50 years later than the second part at Leiden, it follows that each publication has an independent numbering of the columns, starting from one, in view of the facts that there are many references in demotic literatures already to the columns by their numbers, as established by the publication of Lehmann's and Hess, it would have been possible to do, it would have been desirable to retain the existing numbering if possible. But as will be seen by comparison of the hand copy of the whole manuscript, which accompanies this edition with the former publications, the changes in the way of consolidation of the columns, and in some cases necessary renumbering of the lines have made it compulsory to introduce a new and continuous numbering of the columns. For instance, the Hess column 10 and Lehman's column 1 form a single column, and the same is the case with Lehman's column 2 and 3 and volume 
oh, and columns four and five, with verso columns 16 and 17, 22 and 23, a comparative table of the old and new numbers we found at the end. The glosses, there are about 640 words with transcriptions and Coptic characters in addition to a few inserted in the text. Besides all the letters of the Greek alphabet, we find the following U's and I don't know if I flipped that around that we're going to have a thing, but we have, okay. Equals 26 fifteenths. Seven thirty thirds are twenty five thirty fourths, and then the next twenty five thirty fourths are thirty five texts. Um, the next we have two thirteenths, five twenty thirds, eight eighths. The next we have one twenty fifths, eight ninths, thirteen five uh, ninths. And the next we have two eighteenths. And in the other column we have nine elevenths, two tenths, nine fourteenths. That's the second uh, that line, I mean that column. And then we have nine fourteenths or twenty-five thirty-fourths. We have two fourths next, then nine sixths or twenty-nine tenths. And next we have two twenty-sixths or twenty-nine tenths. And so what we're looking at the Greek letter, uh, I mean the Coptic. Oh, my Coptic's rusty. Kaka la o sh sh. Fa asha. U ha sa da or treasure no. No, I guess, I guess I'll, oh. So the first we have Kappa. And the second is also the Kappa, you know, K. And then we have the Laula, which makes the L sound. And we have the uh, what did that be? The owl. And then for the next two of the first column, we have the shy. And The fe is the second. Uh, I mean, phi is the second, making the F sound in the that first column there. And we have the hori, making the ha sound. As the third and the fourth, we have the kha, where's the, the, the kha? Um, as the second, to, uh, you know, it's the fifth. And it's the sixth, we have the Dzhan Tria, making that Kra sound as that final one there. But the, uh, I wanna say a Sigma, but that thing that's like a, uh, you know, kind of like looks like the sigma, but I'm I'm not seeing it here, so I'm just going to move on. The glosses were undoubtedly written by the sc same scribe who wrote the demotic text, and it seems that he wrote the glosses before he filled in the rubrics. For the handwriting of the demotic text and of the rubrics is unquestionably the same, and in filling up in red the empty spaces he had left for rubrication. 
The scribe took occasion to fill in with his red ink occasional lapses in the black writing. In the text, this can be observed. For example, 24.1 omitted the uh, letter of the second scepter has been filled up in red and also omitted determinative in the last word of 28.8 and an omitted letter her, or is it her, uh, of 29.11. An omitted word in shun interlineated in 29.12 and a plural sign in 25, 26, and so on to the gloss. Owe in, owe, okay, in 28.8, overlooked when the glosses were originally inserted in black ink. It is a fact that there is often a considerable difference between the Greek letters and the passages written in Greek and the glosses. For example, pap eep at two and 15, 25ths and 15 29ths. And this may be accounted for by the fact that the former are written in a cursive hand with ligatures, while the glosses are carefully written with separately formed letters without ligatures for distinctness sake in the narrow spaces between the lines. The above considerations, however, only show that our texts and glosses were written by the same hand in our existing manuscript. It does not follow that they were written by the original compiler. Max Muller has argued that they must be due to another individual, since they are mostly in Theumic, uh, or trans eight, number 875 is the reference, because Max Muller had a lot written right. Another individual, since they are mostly in the Theumic dialect, while the dialect of the Demotic text is Um Terer Sahidish, you know, Akmimic, so called by Stern, and the record of the translation of 13, 152, he replaces the latter term by a more precise definition. D. Mandart, Stahet, Suishan, Fiumish, Demotic, Metal, Agyptitian, Von, Akmim. Let's terum naher. But it's very doubtful whether this distinction between the text and the glosses can be maintained. The only example quoted by Max Muller that distinctly suggests Fayumic is the gloss lo and l over a group in, uh, you know, Greek letters here, um, over a group in 16 fifths and 25 30 fourths, which he reads as. Regarding the exchange of the, oh, I don't, the, the, what, what's the letter R and L? It's evident from the Theumic dialect, but the demotic group in question does not read Eru, but Mer, as in Mera, one seventeenth, two sevenths, fourteen sixths, twenty eight. And the gloss Lo represents the absolute form of the late Egyptian word, which we see in its constructed form in the Sahetic. The O wash she in less onis in Greek. From the detailed examination of the dialect, it appears probable that the dialect of the text does not show any distinction from that of the glosses, and it is not necessary to go behind the scribe of the present manuscript and place the compiler earlier. He may well have been one and the same. The date. Ruvens placed the date of the manuscript in the first half of the third century of the Common Era, so around the time the Bible was compiled. Um, and this was repeated by Lehmans. Groff and Hess attributed on paleographical grounds to the second century, but in light of recent additions to the knowledge of Greek paleography and the opinions based on them of Kenyon, Grenfell, and Hunt. The third century must be accepted as the date of the manuscript, but this, of course, is the date at which the papyrus it's was written and merely furnishes a terminus and quem for adding 
as to the date of the contents. That the whole of the papyrus in its present state was written by one and the same scribe, with the possible exception of verse 28, can scarcely be a matter of doubt to anyone who has studied closely the handwriting of the original manuscript. It must be stated, however, that Ruvens and Lehmans were of the opinion that the glosses were written by a latter hand than the body of the text. But this question has been discussed above, and apart from the identity of the ink and the material proof given there, it may be added that the erratic glosses of 27 eighths are certainly written by the same hand as the numerous heretic passages scattered throughout the text. The date of its context is a much more complicated question written partially in erratic, partially in demotic, and partially in Greek. They were the aspect of a compilation which is borne out by the varied and disconnected nature of the subject matter. It has been suggested that the work is a translation into demotic of a Greek original and that perhaps this first question demanding discussion. Prima vacia, it may be said to be likely so many similar works exist in Greek. The introduction of three invocations of considerable length written in Greek characters almost compels us to accept that origin for those particular sections. These four, one, through ninths, uh, 15, 24 through 31, 23 over seven through 12, uh, 20. It seems probable that the translator felt he could transfer to the Egyptian the prescriptions and preparations while the formula of the incantation had to be left in the original language. Had these sections been written in Egyptian originally, it is not likely that an incantation of a foreign tongue would be inserted into place, presumably of an Egyptian one. And, in the first named instance, there is the additional evidence of two Greek glosses, not Coptic transcriptions of the demotic words, but Greek equivalents of the two words, table and goose, which seem to be inserted clearly to prevent a misunderstanding of the original terms. In the second instance, 15 over 24 through 31, the original Greek lines of 25 through 28 are immediately followed by a demotic translation of the same passage to 29 through 31, which points in the same direction. Translation from the Greek is rendered probable outside of the passages already referred to by the transcription of Greek prescriptions and substances in 24, 1 through 25, and verso 1, 2, 8, 9. According to an ingenious suggestion, of Max Muller and Verso 2, the otherwise intelligible phrase ma nes n rum is almost certainly a mistranslation of mag nasia den draya. Max Muller has also given strong reasons, um, you know, translation 8, 175 through 6, given strong reasons for regarding the passage 25, 23 through 37 as being translated from a Greek original. However, even where there are reasons for believing that the demotic is a translation from the Greek, the original source in relation to magic at any rate was probably Egyptian, certainly so in the case of the Greek passage in 15, 25 through 28, which has itself so clearly an Egyptian origin. On the other hand, some of the chief sections in the manuscripts show no traces of Greek influence, example, columns six, and 15, one through 20, but it would be rash to say that they are older. They may well represent only a purer Egyptian source. Max Muller in his translation eight through uh, number 172 has suggested that some of the magic formula go back to the period from the 18th to the 20th dynasty. This cannot be true of more than a few phrases. The language indeed is not entirely uniform, but Throughout the papyrus, the vocabulary and grammar are distinctly not late Egyptian, they are demotic, and that too of a kind which approaches Coptic much more closely than in any other known papyrus. Certain passages, such as the spell in 13, 1 through 10, show more or less an archaism, but in all cases, it is mixed with late forms. The use of heretic might be thought to indicate some antiquity where it occurs. 
But the writing is a strange jumble with the demotic, a single word being often written partially in hieratic, partially in demotic. Where the hieratic signs occur, the language is not generally more archaic than when the demotic is pure. In 23 over 24, the word abrasax is written hieratic. Now, abrasax is usually regarded as a typical Gnostic invocation name. Iran at us, having stated that it was invented by Basilides in 125 of the Common Era, the statement is now generally regarded as an error, and the name may be earlier. And, you know, as I've pointed out in like the Goetia number uh, 44, that there is an Egyptian root for that. But there is no authority for placing it in pre-Christian times. I don't know. I think the Greek form actually does go a couple of centuries before Christianity. But um, not many documents written in the Heretic have been ascertained to be later than the first century of the Common Era. But there were plentiful attendees among the burnt papyri found by Professor Petri and the house of Bak Aku Eu, otherwise known as Asikis, the destruction of which Mr. Petri was supposed to date at 174 of the Common Era, and Tanis 1, page 41, and Clemens Alexandrius, Strom 5, 237, mentions Heratic is still taught in the schools in 160 to 210 BC, uh, I mean, to, uh, of the Common Era. Hieroglyphic inscriptions with the name of Decius, 249 to 251, are found in the Temple of Esna, and the existence of hieroglyphic almost implies that of Heratic. Judging by the language, it is difficult to believe that any part of the work in its present Redaction is more than a century or two older than the papyrus itself. And so we don't need to go into any of the comments too much. And we'll get into uh, the translation and the rest of the columns. So, Sharma, peace be upon you. Oh, I don't know if it sounds different in Demotic or something, but. That's the ancient Egyptian for peace, if one is. 